Hey guys, uh, welcome back to day two. Um, I've been grading your questions from, uh, well, that you've been putting in today. Um, and I had some really good questions. Thank you guys for that. Um, one I wanted to kind of talk about was, uh, there was a question about, several about gerrymandering. And I want to tell you a story that's pretty good about, uh, this happened both in Wisconsin and Texas. Um, the state legislatures generally get to control the drawing of the districts after the census. I know in Kansas that'll be the case. Uh, the state legislature in Kansas is controlled by Republicans, so they can draw the lines to favor their party. Well, guys, in Texas, um, for decades, the Democrats controlled the state legislature in Austin. Well, guys, about... 20 years ago, that eh, maybe 15, that changed. And what ended up happening is because the Republicans got to redraw all these districts, which is now, I think, uh, something like 34 or 36, um, maybe even 38, um, they uh, redrew all those lines and the Democrats were so angry um, they actually uh, fled the state to New Mexico uh, and stayed in hotels just across the border because the rules in the state legislature said they couldn't vote um, if the Democrats weren't there and they couldn't change the district lines. And so the Republicans caved in and said, OK, we'll we'll uh, we'll work with you on this. And so the Democrats came back to Texas uh, but then um, they weren't happy. So this time, as Democrats do, they shared the wealth and went across the border into Oklahoma. And eventually Republicans caved some more and they were able to vote and redraw those districts. So if we're talking 36 districts, that's 36 seats in the House of Representatives out of 435. So you can see the big impact. Now, California, which has 55 uh, House seats, uh, this says 53, now they have 55. Um, they actually set up a citizens council uh, to break up theirs into 55. Um, I'm not sure how well that's working for them. Uh, I know it made some members of Congress unhappy because it changed their uh, districts so that actually two members were living in the same district. And so people got upset about that. Okay. Uh, other questions I had were over, like, the unconstitutional nature of gerrymandering. Uh, this district in Louisiana uh, stood up to the Supreme Court's constitutional muster. So they didn't declare this unconstitutional. And if, I, if you don't declare this unconstitutional, I don't know what you're going to declare unconstitutional, okay? So the fact is... Uh, these politicians in the states uh, get to draw these lines uh, just like they do in Kansas and they can do it to favor their party okay so that answers some of the questions that you guys had others are um, stuff that we're going to be uh, talking about getting into today and tomorrow okay so I'm gonna move to the next slide and this is just some basic information guys on you know, how Congress is set up, how do you, you know, what are the qualifications? So if we were in class, I'd ask you, okay, so do you have to be uh, a U.S. citizen to be serving Congress? The answer is yes. You do not have to be a natural born U.S. citizen. Okay. You just have to, for the House of Representatives we're talking about here, uh, 25 years old. Uh, you have to be a citizen for seven years and you have to live in the state and actually, you're supposed to live in the district that you represent. So in Kansas, that would be the 4th District. If I go back here, Ron Estes has to live in the 4th District in order to represent the 4th District, if that makes sense. Okay. So those are the only qualifications. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have a high school diploma. You don't have to have a college degree. None of that. Okay. Um, so that's it. Okay. Now, each member... Uh, makes $174,000 a year. Remember, we talked about how, um, you know, the 27th Amendment. They can only increase that if they do uh, until an election takes place. 
Um, some of the question, one of the questions you, a couple of you asked was, well, do we increase the size since our population's gotten so big? We have 435, and they made it that in 1910. Well, it's been 110 years, and our population has grown a lot. Well, there's some considerations there. One, 174,000 for every member you add. And then you're going to have to, um, you know, do some serious construction at the U.S. Capitol to make more room for more people. Um, it's a great question and something we should probably consider. Um, trying to get 435 people to agree on anything is difficult. Um, if we add, you know, 100, 150, uh, yes, that makes us closer to our representatives. Um, but um, does it complicate things even more? That's a great question, really a matter of opinion, okay? Now, each member of Congress has office space in those buildings. They are allotted money for their staffs. Um, they get a budget for travel and to man maintain an office and a residence in both their home state and in Washington, D.C. Some other benefits they get. Uh, franking privilege, not Franklin, franking privilege. Uh, means you you can send mail to your constituents at no cost. Um, now you can't send campaign literature, but if Ron Estes wants us to know, you know what he's doing in Washington, what he's voting on, what he's voting against, those sorts of things, he can mail that out to every person in his district. That's seven hundred and fifty thousand people um, for free. Uh, this is kind of an advantage for incumbents. We I had some questions about that. Um, actually, it was kind of funny. Uh, Blair put on, on the, her question, uh, incompetence uh, instead of incumbents. And some people would say, yeah, some of these people are incompetent. Yes. Um, but I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, anyhow, uh, they also get nice pensions, um, life insurance, tax deductions, that sort of thing. And then this is kind of interesting, this uh, immunity. Um, members of Congress cannot be sued for what they say while they're performing their duties as members of Congress. And guys, I can point out to you dozens of examples where members of Congress will just bold face lie to the American people and they know they can't be sued for it. Uh, it's, it's actually kind of disgusting. It, it bugs me. Both parties do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's ugly. So another part of that is that members cannot be arrested in Congress or on their way or to, to or from a meeting of Congress unless charged with a serious crime. The reason why they do that, I mean, most people used to travel in, in the beginning by horse uh, and then by automobile. Uh, a lot of members fly now in and out of Washington. Um, but if you were traveling through an area and you were going to make a very important vote, that say we're talking about segregation and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and you were traveling through, you know, Georgia or Alabama and the people there didn't want you to get to Washington so you could vote, um, they could just arrest you and prevent you from getting there to vote. Um, this protects also against, you know, repercussions for making a tough vote and then somebody trying to arrest you for some you know, silly reason uh, as retribution, okay? So those are immunities for members of Congress. One more thing before I switch to the next slide is the staffs. Um, I've known a couple of Bishop Carroll grads that have worked on congressional staffs uh, and, and staffs of governors and so forth. This is a career that uh, some people choose to do if you're interested in political science and so forth. Okay, so moving on, um, moving over to the Senate. Okay, uh, so unlike the 435 members of the House, there are 100, two from each state. Now, the first Senate, since we only had 13 states, had 26 members. Their terms are different. Instead of two years terms, they have six year terms. Okay, however, one third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. So 2020... There'll be 33, 2022, 33, and 20, 
24, there'll be 34 members up for, uh, let me see that, up for election, okay? And so that is, that allows uh, us to have continuity and experience. Continuity and experience in its membership. So you're always going to have at least um, 66 members with at least two years of experience in the Senate. Okay. Um, so our senators, Moran and Roberts, aren't actually elected in the same year. So Roberts is up for re-election this year in 2020, and he's actually retiring. So that's an op that'll be an open seat uh, that Republicans and Democrats will both try and get. Okay. Now, if the senator dies while in office, the governor will appoint a new member until a special election or until the term expires. So a lot of times the governor um, will just get to appoint that, uh, a new person, even if it's in the first year of that person's term. And this just this was in the news recently. Um, I don't know if you saw this. Um, probably not. But uh, President Trump just commuted the sentence of the former governor of Illinois. His name was Rob Blagojevich. Blagojevich was the governor of Illinois when Barack Obama, who was a senator, was elected president of the United States. And President Obama had to give up his seat in the Senate. So Blagojevich, the governor, gets to appoint the new senator. Well, Blagojevich saw an opportunity uh, to sell that office to the highest bidder. And there were several people that wanted that Senate seat. It's pretty sweet. You don't even have to run for office. You just get appointed, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, well, the FBI was tipped off to the fact that Blagojevich was really entertaining money uh, for this seat. And so they wiretapped him, and they caught him. And uh, he went to jail. And he's been in jail since uh, about 2010. And uh, I forget how many years he had to serve, but uh, after about 10 years, uh, President Trump commuted his sentence to the time served of 10 years in office. Some people didn't like that. Um, some people thought it was okay. Um, I don't, I mean, 10 years is pretty good uh, for something like that, I would say. Uh, for most people. Um, there's some other stories here. Um, in fact, there's a movie based on this idea of a senator dying in office, and it's called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. It's a movie I really want you guys to watch. Um, I'm going to try and find a link to it. If not, one thing I might do is stream the video on here and upload it for you. Um, it's it's old black and white movie, but it's really good uh, if you give it a try. Um, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, so uh, I'll try and figure that out in the next couple days, and hopefully you guys can watch that movie, uh, and I'll give you some points for coming up with some questions and stuff like that. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide on the Senate. Okay, so remember, 100 members, six-year terms, staggered. Now, the qualifications to become a United States Senator, uh, similar to the House, but uh, this is seen as a little bit more um, of an, you know, an older group, more experienced group. So you got to be at least 30 years old uh, and a citizen for nine years, and you have to live in the state that you represent. Okay, this is one of my problems with our Senator uh, Pat Roberts is, you know, he really hasn't lived in Kansas for uh, many years. He has a house in Virginia. His kids went to school in Virginia. He just kept an address in, in Kansas, um, which I don't really like. Uh, Senator Jerry Moran, uh, from what I understand, he travels back to Hayes, which is where he's from, Hayes, Kansas, um, every weekend. Um, flies either into Kansas City or into uh, Wichita and drives out to Hayes. Um, which, you know, I appreciate that. Um, they make the same amount of money as, as House members. Same benefits, same uh, benefits and immunities as the House. Um, 
So when you go into Congress, guys, we we have the most diverse Congress that we've ever had in history. Now, as you know, with most things, uh, as this country began, uh, it was white men, okay, mostly Protestant men. Um, and over time, that has obviously changed. Um, so the last Congress was the most diverse, and then the current Congress is the most diverse, and that continues to happen uh, each time we have elections. And that comes, uh, when I talk about diversity, I talk about women in Congress, um, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, Native Americans, uh, and so forth. Um, we even have had, you know, uh, gay members uh, of Congress as well that were openly gay. So um, there are some good statistics on that um, that I, I, I'll sometimes go through. Um, there is a section in your book on um, members of Congress. Um, and, you know, generally a lot of them are lawyers, uh, a lot of former military folks, especially recently we have, you know, from the Gulf War, the Afghan War, um, the Iraq War, we, we have quite a few veterans serving um, the World War II generation, Vietnam generation, had a ton of uh, members of Congress, okay? Um, these are a couple of the old guys. This was uh, Strom Thurmond, who served in the United States Senate till the ripe old age of 100 years old. He was reelected at 98 and died when he was 100 while a member of the Senate. This is uh, his name, Strom Thurmond. He was a Republican from South Carolina. This is Robert Byrd. Um, he was a longtime senator from West Virginia, Democrat. Okay. All right. Um, moving on. Okay. This is a little bit more uh, in depth. This is. Um, not as factual as what we just talked about, like qualifications and so forth. Now, some of this stuff you know um, already. Uh, express powers we've talked about, those are specifically listed in the Constitution. Uh, and the power to make laws in five different areas they show here. Government finance, coining money, regulating trade, uh, foreign and interstate between states, uh, providing for the military forces, uh, law enforcement, the national courts, and then governing Washington, D.C., and, you know, adding new states is something that uh, there's a process for found in the U.S. Constitution, okay? But as we move forward, one of the things you're going to have to be able to do is differentiate between powers of the House of Representatives and powers of the Senate, Okay. So the next slide is going to kind of take us there and show us some of these powers uh, that we can find there. Okay, so these are special powers held by the House or others by the Senate or both. Now, this is one that we just saw uh, in action uh, as late as, shoot, it was uh, January uh, into February. Okay, and that is impeaching officials. Okay. So Congress has the power to bring federal officials to trial. Uh, types of people that can be impeached. The president, the vice president, and federal judges. They can be removed if they commit a serious crime against the country. Okay, So you guys know this. We've talked about it. Impeachment means to formally accuse, and this is done only by the House. Okay. Um, there we go. And um, then once they come up with charges, okay, those are passed on to the Senate, where the Senate will hold a trial, okay. Um, if the if the if a judge is on trial, the vice president, who is the president of the Senate, will be the judge. If the president's on trial, the chief justice of the Supreme Court is the judge, and that's what we just saw with. Um, with uh, President Trump, okay, yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fix this. Well, right now, can I click on that? No, sorry. Let's go here, and we'll do this. 
this and this and Donald J. Trump 2020. Okay. I don't know why that is hiding. There we go. Oh, look at that. Oh, geez. I don't know why it's messing with me like that. Okay. There we go. Sorry about all that. Look at that. I can't even spell Donald. Let's see here. How's that? Okay. All right. So it takes two thirds to convict in a situation like that. Okay. <laughs> How frustrating is this? Look at that. Okay. Not convicted. Excellent. Okay, so you got the impeachment there. All right, let's look at some other stuff. Okay, only the Senate has the power to approve treaties. Okay, this makes two thirds majority. You guys all had history last semester, so you know about NATO. NATO was something that was a treaty joined by many countries, originally 15, but now it's up over 25. Um, that had to be done by the Senate. Okay, we go back to Woodrow Wilson down here and talk about the uh, League of Nations, uh, which was created after World War I. It's President Wilson's idea, 14 points there, and the Senate rejected it. Okay, they said, nope, we're not turning our sovereignty over to an international body. The United Nations in 1945-46 the Senate approved that, so we're a member of those, okay? Then presidential appointments. That's another role of the Senate, only the Senate. So the Senate has the power to reject all major appointments by the president. Who does the president appoint? Federal judges, Supreme Court justices, ambassadors, cabinet members, okay? This only takes a majority vote. It does not take two-thirds, okay? So that's specific powers of the Senate, all right? Now we're going to move over back to the House and some of their power. Okay, with this, deciding elections. Okay, as we've talked about before, guys, you have to get a majority of the Senate. Okay, so, or excuse me, a majority of the Electoral College. There's 538 electors. Okay, you divide that by 2, that equals 269 plus 1. There's the math on that. Okay, you need 270, okay? Now, say there's a tie. There could be a 269 to 269 tie. Or if you had a strong third-party candidate that got some electoral college votes, um, you could have a situation where the House would have to decide, okay? So the representatives of each state have a collective vote. So we have four members of the House in Kansas. Three of them are Republicans. One is a Democrat. Kansas gets one vote. So it'd be three to one in Kansas. Kansas would vote for the Republican. Does that make sense? California has 55. Majority of those are Democrats. So we know California would have one vote and it would probably go for the Democrat. This has happened twice in American history. 1801, Thomas Jefferson and John Quincy Adams, these two guys down here. Um, now, with the Senate um, for vice president, we don't need that anymore. If you remember the 12th Amendment um, said that we elect the president and vice president together. There was one time in 1837 where the Senate had to do that, um, but that is not really a factor anymore because we elect the president and vice president together. Okay. Ignore this uh, stuff down here. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to do one more slide. Um, and this one here shows you the leadership of uh, Congress today. Okay. 
and some of these numbers might have changed a little bit okay but the Senate leadership uh, is all the same okay uh, so the Republicans have the most seats okay it's uh, 53 to 47 these two are independents Bernie and Angus King they both go with the Democrats so it's really 53 47 okay um, if you don't caucus with one of the two parties and you're an independent you have no power you have no real say you want to be with one of the two major parties okay so the most powerful person in the Senate today is this guy Mitch McConnell he's the majority leader in the Senate he's the most powerful okay then the number two man in the Senate is the whip okay the Republican majority whip because they have the most seats Chuck Schumer is the majority leader in the Senate and then his right-hand guy is Dick Durbin the uh, minority whip the Senate president pro tempore if you'll recall uh, is a ceremonial position Chuck Grassley has been in the Senate longer than any Republican okay and so he gets this title and he is fourth in line to be president so if something were to happen to um, the president the vice president and the speaker of the house this man Chuck Grassley would become president it doesn't really give him any real power in the Senate okay okay then we move down to the house leadership and of course the Democrats have more seats than the Republicans okay and so Nancy Pelosi is the speaker they choose her the Democrats these 235 members choose her to be the leader okay and then the majority leader Democrats are the majority Steny Hoyer so that he is her right-hand man okay and then your majority whip I'll explain what these whips do in a second then the, the most powerful Republican in the house is Kevin McCarthy of California and the whip is Steve Scalise of Louisiana okay that's your congressional leadership for the 116th Congress that means we've had Congress times two two years for each Congress uh, do the math uh, 232 34 years 30 32 years okay um, so in 2020 we'll get a new Congress it'll be the 117th okay and both parties are going to be fighting hard to win majorities in these two bodies okay now as far as what is a whip um, they're really um, in charge of knowing how many votes their party has lined up for a vote um, how many members are going to vote with the leadership and they're kind of arm twisters I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase whip somebody in the shape or twist somebody's arm to get them to do something these whips are kind of they get the pulse of their caucus the Democrats or the Republicans their caucus and find out how they're gonna vote try and convince them to vote with the leadership Nancy Pelosi has a lot of power she can convince members the whip can convince members to vote a certain way okay at least they can try okay and so that kind of wraps that up now as we move into tomorrow guys we're gonna look at um, the committee system so there's 435 members and 100 members and how they get their work done is split up into committees and so that'll be the focus of what we talk about tomorrow I uh, hope you enjoyed this um, I am gonna maybe after doing a couple of these ask you guys whether you'd like to do this live with zoom um, or just get the recorded videos like this okay and I will post um, an assignment for this lecture of two questions you guys did a great job uh, I've graded half the class 13 to 26 and turned it in by the time I made this video so uh, keep up that good work and um, we'll see you tomorrow bye